We're very happy to have here Ben Recht from the, the other UW uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Ben was an undergrad, a math nerd at Chicago, where he started an electronic music band that was named after Galois theory. He then went to the MIT Media Lab for grad school, where he did a lot of things with blinking LEDs uh, before doing a postdoc at Caltech, uh, where he worked on, uh, on control theory and these kind of statistic problems, and in particular, did this paper with Condace on uh, matrix versions of compressed sensing, which has gotten a lot of attention. And now he's going to talk about a, a nice mix of theory and practice uh, today. Thanks, Aaron. That was, that was great. I'm very much looking forward to when I get to introduce you at a talk, because Aaron and I have known each other for probably far too long. Um, yeah, so before I get going, I wanted to point out two things. First of all, uh, I noticed that the title of the talk was actually spelled wrong on the colloquium website. Very important they have small caps. I don't know why that's so important. The other thing I'd like to say is this is joint work with uh, Feng Yu, Christopher Ray, and Stephen Wright. Uh, Christopher Ray was uh, a graduate student here. He speaks very fondly of all of you guys. And uh, if I say you hear some kind of misinformation or see anything incorrect, or if there's anything wrong in the slides, that's Chris's fault. So we'll just keep that in mind. So what I want to talk about today is, uh, is a very simple problem, or at least looks simple, but it's also very fundamental, which is minimizing a function that's given by that the form above. Okay, so f here has a sum into a lot of different terms, and we just like to find the minimum. So what we what we learn in, uh, at some point in our undergraduate, usually in calculus, is that all we have to do is solve this equation: find a place where the gradient is equal to zero. And the algorithm that I'm going to spend almost all of today on to solve that equation is called stochastic gradient descent, which you may have heard. Uh, I looked at the colloquium calendar. There are definitely a lot of people coming through talking about machine learning uh, this semester, so you may, this might be new to you. But for those of you who are not, this is how it works. What we do is to minimize this, this uh, sum, which is, uh, has all these different terms, what we're going to do is sample one. We're going to pick one uniformly at random. We're going to compute the gradient of the individual term. And then we're going to follow that individual term's gradient by some step size. Whereas normal gradient descent would follow the full gradient, which would essentially be the sum of all of these little gradients, uh, we're just going to follow one of these increments. And then the question is, when does that work? So it turns out that, that it was observed to a work in the 50s. And uh, there's a nice paper by Robinson Monroe. Uh, it was also independently uh, uh, invented by Woodrow and Hoff in, in electrical engineering. Uh, it's called the least mean squares filter in that case. Um, and so, uh, this kind of gave rise to a large body of work in adaptive control, kind of had a heyday, and then kind of went away for a little while. Um, neural networks folks also independently in invented this algorithm. And really, at the end of the day, this is all backpropagation is. It's following the gradient of one example at a time. And finally, it's been, like I said, everybody's been into it in the last decade or so. Has been a lot, there's a lot of interest in the last, especially two years, uh, because there's a lot of connections with online learning and um, a kind of a res uh, resurgence of interest in stochastic approximation. So I want to start by first giving us a few examples of why we'd like to actually use this particular algorithm. I'm going to give some prototypical problems. I'll then lead us through why it actually should work. And then I'm going to talk about the majority of the talk is going to be about how do we actually scale this algorithm to big, massive data sets on the kind of infrastructures that we're building. OK. so. Uh, one of my favorite examples, and people have seen me give talks before, I always kind of use this slide, uh, where these things come up are in recommender systems. So uh, everybody, you can't get away from these things. Uh, the internet is trying to make you always trying to make you buy stuff. And as far as I can tell, the only thing of value anymore is the size of your user base, because then we can data mine better. And in these cases, you get to learn a little bit of information based on which filter I decide to put on a uh, photograph. Apparently, that is going to be very highly correlated with our uh, what ads we're going to want to see, or at least that's what Facebook just decided a couple weeks ago. Uh, but what more, more commonly, we, you're familiar with on Amazon, they recommend products to you based on your past history, or on Netflix, they're going to recommend movies to you based on uh, which ones you rated and how you rated them. Or on online dating, you give a little bit of information about yourself, and they're going to try to find your soulmate. Um, if, I, if I focus on the Netflix one, which I like mostly because they offered money. So that's what got us all interested in looking at this problem to begin with. Uh, they had a very specific challenge, which they kind of posed to, uh, to all of us, which is, look, here are 100 million of our ratings. 
All we want you to do is improve our system by 10% on some other set of 3 million. And they basically gave us a bunch of their ratings of different movies and of a bunch of their users. There was 17,000 or so movies and about 500,000 users. And the goal is just to predict those extra 3 million to some high accuracy and root mean square error. Okay, so in this case, we have this like this giant data matrix, which would have a total of 8 billion entries, and we're just trying to fill in those missing blanks. Okay? So a very popular abstraction for how we might fill in the blanks, well, first of all, to fill something in, you need to assume some structure. The question is, what structure are we going to assume? And a popular one, and kind of the first thing we teach in a machine learning class, is to assume that there is some kind of low rank factors that give rise to most of the information you need to fill in the data. Okay? That is to say that this data matrix of all the ratings uh, uh, of all the users is low rank, which simply means that there are some eigen users out there, basically people who like romance movies or people who like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever you might have, and those eigen users will completely determine everybody else. We just have to figure out everyone else's ratings. Okay? And the reason why this is useful is if we just look at parameter counting, the big matrix has k times n entries. The small matrix has r times k plus n entries. And the, the second one is much smaller than the first. So that's the difference between, uh, in, in the first case, we had, in the Netflix case, we had 8 billion being k times n. Uh, but if, let's say, there are only 20 or so factors that might give rise to your, mu your movie preferences, then we're down into the tens of millions, in which case the problem is actually overdetermined. So this is a popular abstraction. It was actually the basis of the first publication on the, the Netflix prize problem. And so what did they actually do? What actually was kind of the foundation of how you, how you win? And the way you win is by, well, OK, so now I'm citing myself on this slide rather than the person who actually did it. The person who we should probably be attributing it to, the, to is some fellow named Simon Funk. I don't know his real name. That was the name of his live journal, um, which I don't know if that even still exists. Are so, people still live journaling? No, who knows? Anyway, so here, here's how we solve this. So what we want to do is minimize, and everything I'm going to do is going to come out as writing everything in terms of the function, the sum that we had on that first slide. We want to minimize the squared error between what we observe, which would be this matrix M, and some, some matrix X, which is what we're trying to infer. And then we're going to penalize something, and this is something that's very close to, to my heart and to, to Marion Fassel, who was kind of a pioneer on using this penalty. Uh, you're going to penalize according to the sum of the singular values. Now, you don't have to know what that means, because if you squint a little bit and you do a little bit of manipulation, and uh, Mariam, if you, have to, you want to know how to do this, go ask Mariam. Uh, we approximate x in this form, l times r. We do a little bit of uh, pushing symbols around, and we have this form. And this is the problem we have to solve. So in this case, we want to, instead of inferring some big matrix x, we're just going to infer the factors, l times r. We have some matrix m that we're targeting. And you see it has the, the form of the problem that we wrote in the first slide. It is a giant sum. It has 100 million terms in the case of the Netflix prize problem. And each of these uh, terms only depends on one of the rows of L and one of the columns of R. OK, so, so if I want to predict the entry in that blue square, what would I do? Well, then I would just look at all the entries in L. I would look at all the entries in R. I would take their dot product. That would be my prediction. And in fact, that's actually, if you look at the stochastic gradient algorithm for this, that's pretty much how it works. What we do is we pick one of these entries at random that's been given to us. You compute the error based on where I currently am. I have some current factorization in the matrix. I compute my error. Okay? And that's easy to do. I just look up this one row, and I look up one column, and I multiply them together. And then what is the, the gradient step? Well, I just take a step according to this rule. Now, this is a mixture of what I had before, which was an L. Uh, L gets added a little multiple of R. And the proportion of that multiple is just how wrong am I? And believe it or not, that's just following our gradient rule. Now, that's really easy to do, right? That is the pseudocode. Uh, and, and our friend Simon Funk did post this on his live journal a few months after the initial Netflix su submission. And he, you know, with a little bit of crowdsourcing, just using this algorithm, they were able to get a 6.5% improvement over the Netflix engine, whereas a million dollars was worth a 10% improvement. And the guys at the top who ended up actually winning, and this is, I, I'm, I've been too lazy to recreate the leaderboard here, but uh, the guys who won at the top ended up using this algorithm amongst a bunch of others. So then, and then did a lot of tuning over the course of about three and a half years and, uh, to win the prize. I think that actually, oh, I don't know. 
my guess is that Netflix is only doing the simple thing at this stage of the game and not the more complicated factor models. All right, so there's one example. I'm going to spend actually a lot of time on that particular example, which is why I kind of emphasized it. Also, it's a problem I've been thinking about for six years now, so always easy for me to share it with you guys. Um, but let me give you more examples of problems where we might want to run something like stochastic gradient descent. Um, at Wisconsin, uh, Chris and I got paired up very quickly with a collaboration that works on neutrino physics. This is just, uh, I'm not exactly sure how this initial connection was made, but it's turned out to be completely fascinating. So uh, when I was in college, which is now dating me a little bit, I was taught that neutrinos don't interact with anything. It turns out that is not true. Actually, and most people are saying, what, what is a neutrino? Okay, whatever. It's this particle. It's out there in the universe. It has some energy. And basically, if I had a, a, a water molecule, and I was lucky enough to get a neutrino from, that was emitted by some supernova you know, 20 billion years ago, and it hits that water molecule, then every once in a while, it will actually emit something called a muon. Okay, now I haven't made anybody's life easier because what the heck was some muon? Well, a muon is basically just a fancy electron. It's a heavier version of an electron. And uh, I know there, actually, there are a lot of quantum information people in here, so I, I, I recognize some faces. You guys know what muons are, right? They, they at least make you learn that. You don't have to know that to do quantum computation. That's kind of part of the, the flavor of physics. Okay, so if I, if I take this thing and emit some muon, and the muons actually emit something called Shrenkov radiation, so it's this kind of blue wavelength of light. And so once it was actually observed that these things could occur, and they kind of observed that some of these things could occur in um, these giant uh, super collider experiments, people started to figure out, I, maybe all I need to do is get a giant tub of water somewhere, and then I can start measuring neutrinos coming from cosmic rays just in that water. And so where do we have a lot of water? Well, the South Pole has a big frozen chunk of water. And so what the Ice Cube project did is made a kilometer by kilometer by kilometer cube of photodetectors, kind of centered down, drilled about a mile down into the polar ice cap. And they sit and wait for it to be hit by neutrinos. And so each of these little guys is what's called a uh, digital optical module, and it's just looking, sitting around waiting for photons. And so these guys get bombarded with cosmic rays. A lot of times, uh, these muons actually occur not from neutrinos. They just come and right now we're being hit by millions of muons, believe it or not. And so now the goal is to figure out which are the muons that came from the sky that we're being hit from, and what are the ones that managed to uh, come from neutrinos. Now the safe bet is if, if it's going upwards, it came from a neutrino. Because in order to actually get through the Earth's crust, you have to have a very, very high energy particle. So if it came, went through the Earth's crust and went upwards, that is an interesting event. So essentially, the entire Ice Cube project can be reduced to what's called a support vector machine. Don't tell the physicists. <laughs> so what, what the support vector machine does is just try to say, I have some data that's labeled as events I like. I have some data that's labeled as events I'd prefer to throw away. And I would just like to find some kind of way of classifying between those two. So in the case of the Ice Cube project, this is which ones go up and which ones go down. Okay. But of course, for folks who are doing machine learning, these, this is a ubiquitous tool. Uh, there's also white, like, we, very powerful in using um, for cancer diagnosis from microarray data, for example. Uh, it's also kind of the basis of most of the credit card fraud detection algorithms that are used by all of our, uh, all of our credit card companies. And it's kind of one of the first things we end up teaching people in machine learning class. So let's look at how we could, write, how we could maybe implement a stochastic gradient algorithm on this, on this problem. So in this case, we have a sum of a giant number of terms, which this thing is called a hinge loss, but don't, really, don't worry about it too much. Basically, what it's going to do is if you are on the correct side of the hyperplane, no penalty is accrued. If you're on the wrong side of the hyperplane, you're going to pay a little bit of a cost. And then it's regularized by the L2 norm of the vector x. x is the thing that that black line. z's are the the actual data points that we're trying to fit, and the y's are either plus one or minus one. Okay, so this is the formulation for the support vector machine. We're trying to find x. And again, if I rewrite this, this has exactly the form that would be amenable to stochastic gradient descent. I could write it as a giant number of terms, where these are all my examples. And I would, uh, uh, each of these terms has a simple low complexity gradient that I can compute. It's only a function of each individual example. Um, one more example would be trying to solve graph cut problems. Okay. Now let's just say we'll do the simple version of graph cuts, which are the minimum cuts. 
So graph cuts actually uh, are, are useful. I mean, yeah, there are endless numbers of applications for those. Recently in machine learning, people have been actually having a lot of success doing image segmentation with minimum cuts rather than the more complicated normalized cuts, which many of you might be familiar with. It's also been used by Microsoft Research for doing topic modeling and entity resolution. And these problems also have a really nice form. We would have a sum of weights times the L1 distance between uh, two, node, uh, two variables, xu and xv. XU and XV, each XU is assigned to one of the vertices in the graph, and it just is supposed to be some member of the probability simplex. And what you could interpret of that is if it lies in one of the corners, it belongs to that particular entity that we're trying to resolve. So, or you could abstract the problem away and just say we're trying to solve a large uh, L1 minimization problem. And again, it has the form that we like. It's a giant sum of terms, each of them only requiring some local information. Okay. So, I've, I've now presented, and let's get back to the, the heart of the matter. We have this, this problem where we see over and over again, we can come up with optimization problems where we want to minimize a sum, huge sum of terms. And again, like in the Netflix case, n is 100 million. And the local small gradients involved with each of these terms are actually quite simple. Okay. So it'd be great if this algorithm works. And now I'd like to just give you a little bit of intuition as to why it works. Okay. And so we'll start with one of the simplest ones we can do, which would be computing the mean. All right. So here we just want to minimize the difference between x, x is our variable, and k are just some numbers. So Aaron, what's the answer? <laughs> to put it on the spot. It's two and a half, two and a half. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. So let's see what happens if we do stochastic gradient descent. So in order to do that, we have to pick a starting point, which I'll say zero. We can pick a lot of different starting points. I have to pick a step size. In this case, I'm going to take the classic step size that was proposed by Robbins and Monroe, which is one over two K, where K is the iteration count. And if I just do the first step, I see that I've now taken the mean of the first term. And that the index I've now selected is one. If I do the second step, the index I'll select will be two. This is a very bizarre random model. In that case, I get one half. Lo and behold, we can now put our inductive hat on. We can see where this is going. I actually do get to two and a half. And if I had gone for n steps, I get the mean. Right? So you get, so in this case, I only had to go for four. In general, you see that I could always compute the mean this way. Now, if you noted, there was nothing random about that. There was no stochastic element. I just did incremental gradients. So why do I need randomness? Um, Here's an example where we, where we can see where it comes, to, comes together. Uh, this example was actually contributed by Aram Harrow, so he actually had a, a, good, a big influence on this whole direction. All right, so this is no, it looks like a complicated 2D quadratic, but it really is just a fancy way of writing x squared plus y squared. x1 squared plus x2 squared. You've got to remember your trigonometry to do that kind of stuff. But anyway, trust me, that's just x1 squared plus x2 squared. So the contours of that just look like this disk. Good, it's a nice circle. On my screen here, it looks ellipsoidal. ellipsoidal. I was uh, a little, little worried, but that's nice. Nice bullseye. So let's suppose that we're just going to start aligned with the x2 axis and see where we go. And let's suppose we actually did everything in um, this deterministic fixed order. I'm going to do a constant step size, a half. Now I'm going to save you the trouble of computing the gradient. The gradient has a form like this. Basically, it amounts to just multiplying where you are by a matrix. But you can check that yourself. And now if we go and we check, if we choose a direction uniformly at random, there we go, this is our good demo, we walk around and very quickly converge to this optimal solution. However, if I pick these things in deterministic order, you'll see that it actually takes a very long time to kind of oscillate our way down to the optimal solution. Now, I forgot how many I'd put in here. No, I'm no, just kidding. Anyway, we'll stop at eight. So you see that it actually takes a really long time to get down to this optimal solution. So randomness is important. And we're going to return to, at the end, how much randomness you need. But just keep that in mind. You really do need randomness once you move away from one-dimensional problems. OK. So there's one final slide for motivation. So now you understand why we need randomness. The question is, how well can this work in general? What is our general theory? So it basically says something like this. Uh, the classic algorithm for minimizing this function would be called Newton's method. That might be the first one you'll learn in calculus. And in that case, what you have to do is compute a Hessian matrix and invert it and multiply it by a gradient and take a step size. Don't, don't worry about it if you don't remember. The point is that Newton's method converges super, super fast. It converges what's called quadratically. But it's, so essentially, after t iterations, you have, let, let's say you have five iterations, usually you're in good enough shape to be done. 
However, each individual iteration is quite costly because even just forming the Hessian matrix requires uh, time proportional to n. And n, I said, could be 100 million, so that might be, that might be a big deal. Could be even bigger, could be a billion. Gradient descent converges a little bit less, uh, less quickly, has a slightly better scaling. I mean, it's still linear with respect to n, but I don't need to do any of this quadratic stuff. Uh, so it definitely scales better with dimension, but it still scales poorly with number of data items. Whereas stochastic gradient descent, if you actually look at this table, uh, it has a very sad looking convergence rate. I mean, as compared to these doubly exponential or exponential convergence, we just have one over the number of steps, which that sounds bad. Um, but each iteration itself is, as we said, very compact and small. And if we just look at, we just change our viewpoint of how we should look at the convergence analysis, instead of saying that these are all equal in terms of the number of steps, let's just say all I want, I want to know is, let's say I fix the number of times you can touch individual increments, touch individual f sub j's as items in some kind of table, the story completely changes. So basically after one Newton step or one gradient step, I probably haven't gone too far, whereas after, uh, if I'm allowed n data accesses, I could take n uh, stochastic gradient steps, and if n is 100 million, I might be at a resolution that's good enough to stop, assuming that constant out in front isn't too big. Okay. So it kind, of puts, it kind of changes our perspective of what might be the right thing to do. And if we're really interested in having things that scale uh, in terms of, of pass efficiency, uh, it might be that stochastic gradient really is a good model for problems that we encounter that involve a lot of data. And indeed, we're told all the time that that's all we have to be thinking about, that all of us really have to be devoting our attention to big data. I mean, Barack Obama says that everybody has to stop what they're working on and start thinking about big data. And, so does, and, and, and you know that if it's in the New York Times, that probably means you're five years too late. And we get all these kind of crazy commercials about uh, IBM working on their exascale computing grid. Um, so it's a very exciting time for people doing data analysis. These are these kind of things we should be thinking about. And then there's the question that becomes like, how big should we actually be considering? Okay, how much big data, what is big? I just wanna put that in here because I'm gonna set up that we're only looking at a very particular slice of big data. So question one is, 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 is a gigabyte big? Eh, I don't, I don't know. That fits on my iPhone, so I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if that, I mean, it seems like that's very small data. I mean, really, really even, even a terabyte isn't that big in the grand scheme of things. That really is in the, the footprint of something in the size of my cell phone, we could fit that. However, if you go and ask someone who works on uh, a data processing algorithm like Hadoop, that actually seems big. That's actually kind of a cumbersome thing to process in Hadoop. But it does fit, I mean, that fits on a desktop. And actually, that almost fits in RAM for on a conventional desktop. You don't have to spend too much money now to have a terabyte of RAM on your machine. So that can't be too big either. But actually, that does seem like a good size, because frankly, a petabyte is kind of hard to come by. I mean, the question is, do you guys actually have, does anybody have a petabyte that they really, really need to process to actually work on uh, uh, some application? You know, after I'm talking about, after we put away all the pre-processing, we do all the sifting, we just get down to the actual problem. Do we actually have a petabyte? I have some colleagues who do. People who work on oil exploration seem to be able to generate very, very massive simulations that require petascale processing. But I think for most of us, when we're working on things or when we think about what is meant by big data, we're really more in this regime. And that's where I want to focus today, is like how do we think about how to do data processing in that regime? Um, and I have a, a, the, the, the really kind of obnoxious way to say that is uh, due to my colleague, John Doyle. So I always put this in as an homage to him uh, because I know some people in the room know him well. The way John likes to say this is perhaps we should stop the pedophilia and focus back on what exactly are we trying to do. <laughs> if anybody knows John, he, yeah, they would know that that's actually. You're a terrorist. Huh? You're a terrorist. I'm a terrorist. There we go. That was Aram. Everybody laugh at Aram. All right. <laughs> So when we have our, we have our uh, stochastic gradient does seem well suited to these big data problems. Now, what's the idea? Why do we want to ha do big data? Really, I, I think that at the end of the day, what we want to do is reduce our variance. I mean, it's not really even that controversial a concept. If we can get more data, we should have lower variance. 
And we just want to be able to take advantage of the variance reduction given to us by having collecting more data so we can stop thinking so hard about what complicated model are we going to run and just start focusing in on, let's just go and do something simple and that has a small and predictable memory footprint that is robust to a lot of different noise and uh, the other kind of characters in the data and maybe converges very quickly. And moreover, and this is something I, I learned from uh, uh, being in a CS department for three years, it's really nice to have one abstract algorithm that we could always focus on. Because that allows us to stop worrying about algorithm design and maybe just start thinking about how do I actually couple this to the kind of infrastructures that I have. So let's focus on that. So the, let's actually focus on the, the heart of this, which is I, I have a machine that sits in the basement of our building. It has a quarter terabyte of RAM. It has uh, 40 physical cores. How do I actually make use of that thing? Okay, because if I have these 40 cores lying around, we, you know, we'd like to put them to work. So a lot of work recently has been looking at how do we make this algorithm, which looks very serial, parallel. It looks serial because it's kind of built on this Markov process where I pick some random data point and take a step along that random data point. And it's not exactly clear what is the right way to make this into something parallel or, make the, or just take advantage of the fact that I have more resources uh, and, and I would like to use them. So there have been a lot of proposals on parallelizing these things. Now you'll note that one of these stands out uh, because it was in 1985. And actually, I, I always note that any time I get involved in a project on distributed computing, odds are it's in this textbook by Bertsekis and Tsitsikli. So every clever idea I think I can have usually was invented by those guys first. This, this, and their book is, uh, Dmitry Bertsekis has made his book available for download. So I encourage everybody to go and get it. It's a great resource. But so in some sense, the, the, the recent stuff by uh, these other authors it more or less is in that earlier text, but they have a contemporary analysis of the problem. Um, but all of the schemes, both in the original Bertsekis and C. Seekless book and uh, these more recent results, uh, re require a lot of overhead because of lock contention. Okay, so it's, in some sense, they need, the processors have to talk to each other. So for example, in the round robin scheme, one processor will update a gradient, tell everybody he's done, the next processor will go. If you have a master worker scheme, in that case, one processor is in charge of writing to the memory, the rest are in charge to, of computing gradients, and they still have to communicate. And in general, that overhead can be quite destructive. And the question is, can we do this without locking and without communication? Because in that case, we can actually get rid of a lot of the overhead that exists in these other algorithms. And I'm going to ask the question, what happens if we just run stochastic gradient without any of these locking structures that are proposed before? We just are going to have some piece of decision variable that's going to sit in memory. We're going to have everybody have free access to it. And essentially, we're going to let them run hog wild on the memory. The question then becomes, can that still work? And can we take care of, can we actually use the fact that we're using a randomized algorithm to our advantage and actually uh, get good speed ups? So in general, you might think this would be bad. I mean, if we we're updating the entire decision variable at the same time, you can imagine you're going to always have collisions. And these writes might actually really kill you. But in all the examples I showed you at the beginning, I was trying to see this in your brain, you don't actually access the entire decision variable, right? You access a little local part that's corresponding to uh, um, the particular instance, the particular increment that we need to access. So I'm going to formalize that in this notion of sparsity. And sparsity here, I'm just going to, and there's, there's a little bit of mumbo jumbo. If you guys don't know hypergraphs, it's really not that hard. The vertices all I want are, are just going to be uh, each unit of memory. And the edges here are just going to be the, the vertices that are coupled together by particular f sub e. So I have this giant, term, giant sum of terms. For each of these terms, each of the f sub e's will depend on a subset of the variable, and I'm going to call that a hyper edge, just for, so it seems like a reasonable abstraction. Okay? So let me define three graph statistics and come back and show you that these statistics tend to be pretty small in the problems that I talked about at the beginning. And these are going to be the crucial ones for actually getting this kind of nice linear speed up when we run uh, our stochastic gradient descent in parallel. OK, so the first one is just how big is an edge? What's the biggest size an edge can be? That's easy calling that omega. The next one is basically a, a normalized version of maximum degree. Okay, so what I'm going to have is I'm just going to look at the maximum number of edges that touch one vertex. So, for, so this is the maximum over the individual vertices. 
Okay, so this is the maximum conductivity. And the second one is called maximum edge degree, which is just the maximum conductivity of an individual edge. So we have a maximum conductivity of a vertex, and then we have maximum conductivity of an edge. So we have omega is the size, delta is the degree, rho is the edge degree. And let's just go suggest that maybe these things can be small. Okay, matrix completion. Okay, remember in this case we have the only thing we need to update a particular increment is to look at one row of L and one row of R. Okay, so in this case the graph is kind of indexed by the rows and columns of the matrix and it's bipartite. And let's say if I were to generate one of these collections of measurements at random, then the, max, the maximum edge size is just the rank that I've picked. The maximum degree is about log n over n, again, because we're normalizing by the total number of vertices. And the maximum uh, edge degree is similarly log n over n, so very, very small. So we would expect, if I were just, let's say, running two of these at the same time, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to write on the same memory at the same time is pretty low. So for support vector machines, I need to bring something else to the table. I'm going to say that I have these examples, which remember were the z's. x is the hyperplane I'm looking for. y are the labels. And I'm going to assume that z's are sparse. That actually happens a lot when we're looking at text data. You have these features, which most of them are 0. Like we're going to say, how often do we see a particular bigram? Most of the time, that count will be 0. Uh, so in this case, we do have a little bit of a messy hypergraph. And it's a little bit harder to nail down these parameters. But what, what, what you can see is that the maximum sparsity level is omega. The maximum degree is now just given by kind of the overlaps between the features. And uh, this edge degree is actually something that's hard to calculate. I point that out that we don't actually have any good way of estimating that edge degree. You'll see in our experiments that that can be almost 1. But our theory is going to still, our, uh, the implementation will still work. So it completely doesn't jive with our theoretical predictions at all. But keep that in mind. Finally, for graph cuts, all of these things are pretty easy. The, the omega is just the size of the simplex that I've assigned on every vertex. The degree is just now the maximum degree, the maximum degree in the graph divided by the number of edges. And the maximum edge degree is twice that number at worst. So these things can be small. So now I can now introduce to you our, our friend the Hogwild algorithm. Again, small caps. Remember, we have to always write things in small caps. Um, so in this case, each processor is just going to do the following. Here's our pseudocode for the Hogwild algorithm. Pick an E from our edge, read the current state only corresponding to the variables that are dependent on that particular function, f sub e, and then do an update one increment at a time uh, corresponding to the stochastic gradient rule. Again, only updating the memory that's involved in this particular edge. And they all do this independently with no locking structure. And the only thing we're really assuming in our analysis is that we can atomically do an add, which actually, th that is a one, one instruction uh, command on, let's say, like a GPU or a DSP. And you can implement it even on a, a, your standard Intel processor with no locking structure. Okay. So now the only questions we have to resolve here are the following. One, our updates can be way out of sync. So we have to basically take into account the fact that we're not doing this Markov chain in this nice kind of uh, lockstep anymore. So we have a bit of asynchronicity in the algorithm. And the second problem is we could have collisions. And we have to look out for both of those. Um, so what happens in theory? So now the next slide, I apologize, is incredibly ugly. Uh, it's got a lot of junk on it. Remember our uh, graph statistics, omega, delta, and rho. We're also going to add an assumption about the function that we're trying to optimize. Now, this is the, these are the standard assumptions that people put when they analyze the convergence of stochastic gradient descent, namely that the global function is strongly convex with curvature bounded below by C and Lipschitz, gradient, Lipschitz continuous gradient, and the Lipschitz constant is L, and that the individual increments are bounded by M. Again, don't worry about all these numbers. You're not going to have to worry about them too much. Uh, these are the, kind of the standard assumptions people put in place. The one thing we do have to assume is we have this fudge factor, which we'll call tau, which is basically saying that the number of updates that happen between the time that I read and the time that I write is bounded by a finite number, which I'm going to call tau. And that's where we put all of the architecture sophistication and specificity. We're just going to hide it in that constant. So then the convergence theory is just this. And I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that expression um, uh, in a second. Um, Basically, we want to converge to a tolerance epsilon, and now I have a bunch of parameters. Okay. 
Let's imagine first, just when you're looking at this, how do I read this? Imagine that delta and rho are zero, so that the graph is completely disconnected somehow. In that case, the rate that you get is m squared over c squared over epsilon, and that is exactly the rate you get in the serial case. So we get the serial convergence rate if those things are zero. And if they're not zero, but they're just a little bit bigger than zero, well, in, in that case, we're still getting a speed up. The reason we're getting a speed up is because this is the total number of updates, but we have, let's say, p processors running at the same time. So we can make the updates p times faster. So the total number of updates goes up, but the time to do an update goes down. And essentially, we get a linear speed up. And it turns out it's like even better in practice than the, the theory predicts. So here's our table. Again, we have support vector machines, matrix completion problems, and uh, cut problems. Uh, I give the relative sizes. These are, none of these are particularly big. We've done bigger problems since. Uh, but it will, you know, again, gigabytes, so it's not really big data. So, but it's, again, it's, it's reasonably sized data, and we can compute a lot of these uh, graph statistics. In particular, note that we can get a five-fold speed up over a serial rate for the SVM, even though that delta term, which we had to, I said that should be small, even though that thing's one. It's like 0.99 something. That's pretty really interesting. So our theory is apparently uh, uh, a, a little conservative in this case. And moreover, we didn't check that it had all those nice convexity properties or bounded increments either. We just kind of ran this stuff. Um, And the other thing I'd like to say, this, these are all run on 10 core machines, right? So the biggest number we'd expect to get would be 10 in terms of speed up. Uh, and the interesting thing about getting these speed ups is we actually have, it's a 12 core machine, but two of the cores are just there to kind of shuffle out data. It's kind of this interesting thing. Actually interleaving the movement of data with the, uh, the actual running the gradient descent does actually make for a big improvement. So two, two seem to be the sweet spot for us. And how does it compare to other stuff? Well, that was actually what was quite interesting. I said at the beginning that there, all these other algorithms use locking structures. Okay? And so let's compare against the algorithms that actually use locks and see how they work. So the first one is a round robin scheme, which is the one where a processor makes an update, tells everybody it's done, another processor makes an update. While the, I mean, they're all computing gradients, but again, they're only updating in this round robin procedure. And um, now the, the x-axis is the number of cores devoted to doing gradients. The y-axis is the speed up. Up is better. And you'll note that in most of these charts, the slope of that red line is not going the right way. The communication is killing. I mean, the theory of that algorithm says it should have a linear speed up. But the communication is making it slow down. The AIG algorithm, which is up there, stands for atomic incremental gradient, which is something we coded up. In that case, what happens is a processor will lock the memory associated with one edge, and only associated with that edge, do the update and, make, uh, and then unlock the memory. So almost no locking. And even that is not as good as this completely lock-free scheme. So even this just a little bit of locking does seem to degrade performance. Now, the one last thing I'll say with these graphs is that you'll see that the, that last one, we kind of get a little bit of a plateau on our graph cut algorithm. And we believe this is because we're getting uh, issues of data movement and poor locality that's actually causing this thing to kind of saturate at about five cores. And the question is, can we actually now, next thing to do, once we've now got a good parallelization, is can we actually make the, uh, make the algorithm more aware of spatial locality and even improve it more? So again, we're going to return to, to my friend the matrix completion problem. Actually, it's much more general. This works for a variety of matrix factorization problems. And it's our algorithm called Jellyfish. So why is it called Jellyfish? I don't know. That, the, the hog wild is a little bit clearer analogy. I'm not, I don't remember exactly why we called it that, but fine, it sticks. So in this case, let's remember, again, we're going to do our matrix completion problem. We're going to take this nuclear norm minimization problem and just turn it into the form that everybody is more comfortable with which is now this stochastic gradient form where we only have to update, uh, we have to access the row and column corresponding to a particular entry and then take a gradient step again in this manner. Where we're only accessing entries of uh, the column LU and the row, uh, sorry, the row LU and the column RV. 
Okay, so here, here's, the, uh, here's the idea. If I just sample uniformly at random, the problem is that now the data, I'm kind of grabbing all different parts of the matrix. And if that matrix is big, I'd probably prefer not to do that. So what I'm going to now do is now break some rules from stochastic gradients and have a very biased sampling scheme. And the sampling scheme I'm going to do is, is based on the following observation. Let's say I was trying to factor this matrix. Just do it, let's say you're just trying to do an eigenvalue computation. And let's imagine that the only entries that are actually present are in the gray blocks. Well, you could do that factorization completely in parallel. You just do a three-way split, because they never have to talk to each other. Those factors don't influence each other. Similarly, if I had the, the checked out boxes, I could do those completely in parallel. If that's where all the entries were, I could compute the factorization completely in parallel. And similarly for the white box. So all we're going to do is we're going to run through the data in such an order that we, we, it looks like it has this layout. So we're going to run through the gray boxes first, then the check boxes, then the white boxes. Again, you're going to permute the data at random. You know, so shuffle the order of the row and column. Call the upper, block, uh, the upper blocks correspondingly to L1, L2, L3. Process those guys in parallel, then do the next set, then do the next set. That's kind of, um, and what's cool about this, we don't have any locks. Not only do we have any locks, we don't even, we, they never have to communicate. And there's never a possibility of a collision or an overwrite. They're really working on independent parts of the matrix. So again, to kind of make a bit of a, a movie here, we start with uh, the matrix laid out as it came to us on disk. And then we randomly shuffle things. This is just to avoid having biases, like where you have things that are really similar to each other, too close to each other. So we we'd like to diffuse out the information. And we're just going to permute the rows and columns. Next thing we're going to do is apply a block partitioning scheme. So again, that's the throw away everything that's, that's uh, off the diagonal, and then you just run the stochastic gradient. And we keep training independently on each of these blocks. When we get to the end, we repeat, and we do that one more time. So what happens in this case? Well, now we just take our off-the-shelf solver that did the serial scheme, um, and actually I took it, we took some uh, MATLAB code and we tried to optimize it as much as we possibly could. Uh, and this was actually a graph that I made in a paper in NIPS of uh, 2010. I was very pleased with myself because we had really hyper-optimized this Netflix thing to run pretty quickly. And well, what's in 10 to the 4 seconds, you know, that's very admirable, a few hours. Uh, now we go and do this jellyfish thing on our 12-core machine, and it's two minutes. So it's already 100 times faster than standard solvers just using 10 cores. And when we went to our 40-core machine that we initially we just installed in the basement, now we're even getting an extra factor of 3. And we don't yet know where this will run out. It was very nice. OK, let me close with one, because as Aram promised some people, I know he sent, sent a note out saying that there was a little bit of theory involved here. Here's the last bit, which is the theory question. I broke the rules. All of our theory basically really needs this kind of random sampling, this uniform, bad locality random sampling to work. Um, when we ran on the Netflix Prize data set, using the biased sampling, which is corresponding to this shuffle and then block uh, descend, we observed that not only was it faster, but the actual number of updates was smaller. Like by the, using the exact same number of data accesses, we had a better lower uh, error at the end. So we have three lines here. There's a green line, which is our biased, bizarre sampling. There's a green, uh, blue line, which corresponds to the theory. And then there's that red line, which corresponds to doing nothing, just doing it in order. And the green line, while it's breaking all the rules of the theoretical analysis, is actually better. Okay? So the theory treats, it, it turns out that the theory treats without replacement sampling or any bias sampling like the red line. And we know that's not true. It's actually completely the opposite. In practice, without replacement sampling for stochastic gradient descent is always faster. And even if you do biased orderings, it's still faster. And the question is why? So the, this last chunk of the talk is about uh, a paper that will appear at Colt in a couple months. Um, and I'm just going to do a very fast overview. And you can come ask me about it later to kind of go into the details. Um, we're, let's just anal analyze something really, really simple, which is least squares. It's kind of my favorite first simple optimization problem. And moreover, let's assume that this thing has an exact solution with zero cost. So this is actually a fancy way of saying, let's solve a system of equations that's overdetermined. 
Okay, so we have an overdetermined system of equations, and we're going to solve it using stochastic gradient descent, which might not be how they teach you how to do it, but okay, this actually will work. Okay, so if we were to do it in a fixed order, again, you write out your gradients. It turns out that things are going to look actually like projection matrices. You write out your gradients, and you get the following expression for the nth iterate. It's where I'd like to be, the optimal solution, plus this matrix product, and all of these products have norm less than one, so they're shrinking things down to zero, times how far I start. If I did it with replacement, basically all I have to do is take an expectation of that, in, that uh, uh, product. And each of the terms are sampled uniformly with replacement, so they're all the same term, and they end up being this matrix to the nth power. And now we actually have a very concrete problem, and the question is, which of these two is better? Is it doing this fixed order? Is it doing it with replacement? Or is there some other order that I could do that has that kind of product form that will get me an even better result? Okay. So it's, it's kind of a clean, clean version of the problem. It's the simplest one we can state. Now, if we go back to Aram's counterexample, again, Aram was the guy who came up with this nasty version, we actually had a case where doing the uniform order, the directions that were uh, just in the order that we were given, is exponentially slower than doing the random order. And that was also seen when I showed that plot before, that if you just do a fixed order for the Netflix virus problem, very slow. And so the question is, what if I just do a random order? Does that get a uh, random order, but a uniformly sampled with replacement random order? Does that get me closer to the optimal solution? And that could be summarized by the following question. I'm going to give you n positive definite matrices. They're all going to be d by d matrices. I want to look at the products that I choose them with replacement. And then I want to say, is that ordering bigger than the products that I choose without replacement? So for scalars, this is just the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. So the answer is yes. And that's probably why we're seeing that the without replacement ordering is always better. And in fact, for matrices, it's true for n equals 2. If we have two matrices, it's true. So it's true for d equals 1 and n equals 2. Uh, it's true if A are selected uniformly at random, and we are yet to find a counterexample to this problem. And we've been searching. We've been wasting CPU cycles just searching for counterexamples. So the question is, is there a non-commutative version of this arithmetic, arithmetic geometric mean inequality? And if so, I think this would have a lot of uh, uh, influence over how do we actually design new algorithms to take care of the fact that these without replacement samples not only are they better in theory, but they actually have a lot of practical considerations that made them better for implementation as well. Okay. So, so here, what are our practical lessons from today? The, the big one, and this is actually not due to me at all, this is what people in parallel computing have been saying for years, and Jim Demmel is going around with this big hammer, is don't lock and don't communicate. When we write parallel code, try to do it with as little communication as possible. And the second issue is that taking advantage of spatial locality, as everybody knows in computer science, is really important and can lead to pretty dramatic speedups. So we have plenty of more stuff that we're trying to do along these lines. Um, we're working on coming up with better bias orderings of stochastic gradient descent, um, working on automatically identifying the locality that allows us to actually have some of the data access properties of uh, the matrix completion problem for more general problems. And finally, we've been grinding and really trying to come to some, make some progress on this non-commutative arithmetic geometric mean inequality. And I'm hoping my, my quantum friends in the room might have some insights on, on how we might make some more progress on that. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Happy to take any of your questions. Any questions for Ben? Work on a 12 core system. This code sounds a bit deportable to CUDA or a GPU. Have you tried it on a system with a lot more cores? We, we haven't tried it on a GPU yet. Uh, part of the reason being is that we just we don't actually have one. Part of the reason being is we've been actually interested in trying to uh, make these things run on our kind of uh, the, on these beefier multi-core machines. The only stumbling block I would see uh, with the GPU is just the data in and out. It's just moving the data in and out. It seems like there's a little bit of an I.O. bound at that point. But it would be awesome if someone could try it. Our code, uh, I will say, our code is all up on the web. So if you guys want to download it and, or, uh, and play with it, we'd really appreciate any feedback um, at these links. Yeah. Um, does this generalize to matrix completion in bases other than 
the standard matrix element bases? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. The question is, does this algorithm generalize, do these matrix factorization al algorithms generalize when the sampling model is not necessarily aligned in the way uh, uh, as entry selection? I'm not 100% sure if it does. Uh, certainly the parallel, uh, the factorization thing seems to still hold. And I know that a lot of the bases that people are interested in uh, do also have a bit of a separability property, meaning that they only are going to interact on, they're only going to interact with certain subsystems. So it's quite possible that it does, but we haven't looked. If there are no more questions, let's thank Ben again. Thank you.